Um, so thank you so much, and thank you so much to the Ros Rosenbluth family, to CPPA, to the UBC for inviting me here. It's such an honor to give this lecture and to speak in the legacy and uh, footsteps of Gideon Rosenbluth, who seems uh, such a wonderful role model. Um, and it's also wonderful for me to be back, to be here in Vancouver. Um, my grandmother was from Vancouver. She was born here. Her, my great-grandfather was a miner outside of Vancouver, and there was a slide. Many people were killed in the slide, and they moved to Vancouver. And I grew up hearing all of these stories, magical stories. Uh, my grandmother would talk about rolling back the rugs and having dance parties on the wooden floors. And I lived in California where we had a lot of shag carpeting. And we always imagined, what would a wooden floor be like? It just seemed really very um, special. So, <laughs> um, so anyways, it's great to be here in Vancouver. And thank you so much for coming. Um, OK, so I want to move from Vancouver in the old days of wooden floors to Manhattan uh, in the current period. And I want to talk first, tell the story of Anita, who's a woman that I met uh, who works for uh, the Tommy Hilfinger uh, retail store in Manhattan, right in the heart of uh, Fifth Avenue. Um, Anita was hired to work in retail first uh, as uh, working 40 hours a week, $9 an hour, um, but she was considered part-time, so she wasn't eligible for health benefits. Um, but she was making it kind of work. She had hours, and uh, as you can imagine, $9 an hour is not really sustainable anywhere, let alone Manhattan. Um, so it was tough, but then things started to get worse. Uh, she actually started to get her hours cut, and they said, well, you're part-time anyways, and we're going to start re rearranging your schedule. They started changing her shifts and making more of her job to be on call. So no longer she, was, she no longer had guaranteed 40 hours a week. She'd have to be scheduled uh, for on-call shifts and call them in the night before or sometimes the morning of to see if they needed her. Um, she had maybe arranged childcare. She had maybe arranged her commute. Um, and they'd say, we don't need you, um, and then she wouldn't be paid. Or she'd come into work, and they'd say, customers are slow today, it's raining, you need to go home after two hours of work, and she would only be paid for two hours, even though that was a violation of the law. Um, most of all, she was worried about her health insurance, and she went to her, her boss and asked, can I get a promotion to full time? And he said, you're not eligible for promotion, uh, you should go and apply for government subsidized health care, and we'll show you how to do that. Um, so she just uh, felt like you know this was impossible. It's not a way to uh, make a living with your schedule changing every week. You couldn't even get a second job necessarily, um, and it just wasn't sustainable. Now, Anita's just one of the people that we've met during our research in New York City talking to retail workers. It's not a, an exceptional case. Unfortunately, this is more and more common. This is the situation that retail workers face. Um, but not just retail, fast food workers, uh, many service sector. But this kind of situation, moving to flexible, on-call, part-time work, low-wage work, it's uh, not just in the service sector. We see it increasingly back into manufacturing. We see it in IT work, the healthcare field, taxi drivers, my own field, university professors. You may find out two days before the semester starts that your class is not full and your class is canceled, and that's no pay, even for the work you did to prepare for class. So unfortunately, we're moving to this model of very low wage, bad jobs, or irregular uh, jobs that have no consistency, no predictability. Um, and again, many of these jobs are paying eight, nine, ten dollars an hour. In the United States, they come with no health care and no benefits. Um, and raises are few and far between. And in retail, many of the workers go into this work because they enjoy the work. They want to be helping customers. They want to deal with clothing and fashion. Um, they see this as something that maybe could be a career, but the field just no longer makes that possible. Uh, Several decades ago, 70% of retail workers were full-time workers. Today, that's reversed. 70% are part-time workers. The field has completely changed. Um, now, we're not just talking about small mom and pop stores. These are major multinational corporations, multi-billion dollar revenues. Um, they're companies like, as you know, Walmart. Uh, but it's not just Walmart. It's uh, pretty much everywhere you look. McDonald's, The Gap. But uh, in, as I said, not just in the service sector, in many other fields of work. Um, what we're seeing is whether there's some debate about whether or not there's an actual convergence of a labor market model around the world. 
that may not be the same pace, it may not look the same way, but we're seeing increasingly similar trends down, pushing wages down and, and making workers more precarious. Um, now, I'm gonna talk tonight a lot about U.S. situation, but in fact, the U.S. is setting the tone for much of the rest of the world's economy, in part because our employers move to other countries and instill their labor practices in those countries, and also the United States clearly um, you know, takes the lead in trade agreements and investment agreements that also set the rules of the game. So, uh, so these uh, trends are impacting many parts of the world. Okay, so first of all, we need to ask, you know, why are there so many bad jobs? What's happening? It's not that there has to be so many jobs. Standard explanation that we hear in many segments is that it's about technology and skills. It's skill bias, technological change. Workers are not keeping up with a fast-paced global economy. They're not getting training in the kinds of IT and high-tech skills that they need. That sounds plausible, but in fact, um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense once you begin to scratch beneath the surface. While there are n the need for some high-skilled jobs and some high-tech jobs, that's a very small percentage of jobs. Even within the high-tech sector, many of those jobs are bad jobs. If you think about this globally, the people working and building your Apple uh, your products and your iPhones, are n those aren't necessarily good jobs, right? These are high-tech jobs, but Tech doesn't necessarily mean good jobs. But it also is the fact that these are not the fastest growing jobs. When you look at the United States, where the bulk of job growth is, these are low wage, and uh, I don't like to say low skill, because I think every job is skilled. But these are jobs that don't require a lot of education. And here's, um, for the United States, the top 20 growth occupations, the number of jobs, um, eight of them require less than a high school degree. Seven require just a high school degree or equivalent. So 15 of the 20 jobs where the most jobs are, these are cashiers, security guards, um, sales, fast food workers, food prep, um, they do not require advanced education. Um, and when we look at job training, and so only one requires a bachelor's degree. In job training, um, only four out of 20 require, uh, four out of 20 require no job training, and 12 out of 20 require very short term. So 16 out of 20 basically don't require much job training. So that's not to say these are not skilled jobs, but it's to refute the idea that this is a problem about lack of education and training. That's not going to get us, more schooling is not going to get us to solve this problem of these low wage bad jobs. Okay. So uh, if it's not necessarily um, these uh, skills and technology, that's explaining this story. Another story is, is it the shift to the service sector? We had uh, lots of manufacturing jobs in many of these economies. Over time, you can see that drops in the United States. It was 40% of jobs in manufacturing. It's now down to roughly 15. Meanwhile, the service sector jobs are growing. So is that the reason why we have so much low wage jobs, so many bad jobs? Well, I'd say, I'd argue that that doesn't make sense either. It really doesn't explain this story because Many manufacturing jobs used to be bad jobs too. We got unions and we got legislation and made the bad jobs into good jobs. Um, the same can happen in service sector as well. And in fact, we see that. We see some sa the exact same service jobs. If we look at McDonald's workers, McDonald's workers in the United States make mostly $7.25 an hour. In Australia, they make $16 an hour. Same company, same job. In Denmark, $20 an hour. So a different context, the same company can pay a much higher wage. Even within the same country, if you compare workers in retail trade who have a, uh, oh, I flipped that around, that should say without a union, the median wage without a union is $11.88 per hour, with a union, $13.30 an hour. In accommodation and food services, it's a dramatic difference. To have a union means that you get $15 an hour median hourly wage versus $9.75. Again, same work. Um, and even now we see you can work for The Gap in Manhattan and make $8 an hour. If you work for The Gap in San Francisco, you make it was $11 an hour, it's going up to 15 So there's no reason a service sector job has to be a bad job. It's about the context, whether you have unions, whether you have collective bargaining, whether you have minimum wage legislation. Okay, so what's another explanation? Another one we hear is globalization, right? That this is what's driving down wages. Um, and I would say in this case, there is um, some... Uh, merit to this explanation. Uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily explain everything, but with globalization, 
with the expansion of markets around the world, we've seen that the labor force globally has more than doubled in the last 20 years as India, the former Soviet Union, China enter the global marketplace. The number of workers in this global labor market has increased dramatically while the number of jobs and capital has not. Um, and what that does is it increases what we call the threat effect. Um, it makes it much easier for employers to say, if you ask for a higher wage, if you try and unionize, I can take this job and move it overseas, or I can bring in workers from other countries as guest workers who have lower wages and fewer rights. So globalization in that sense, and it's not just increasing labor force, but it's the trade agreements, the investment agreements, the changing rules of the game that give employers a lot more rights and give workers a lot fewer rights. And all you have to do is compare what a trade agreement has in it in terms of corporate rights to what we've seen trends in immigration. The ability of people to cross borders gets restricted as the ability of in money and jobs and investment to cross borders increases. So with globalization, we get increased corporate rights uh, and uh, we get a greater power of corporations, uh, employers, uh, in relative to workers, relative to citizens, relative to the environment. But the reason I don't like to say it's globalization in general is because a global economy doesn't have to be an unfair or bad economy. It's a specific form of globalization, um, what some people might call uh, Corporate globalization, some people call neoliberalism, but it's, it's not globalization in and of itself that makes things so difficult. It's this particular form. And what neoliberalism has at its core are things such as privatization, um, financialization, deregulation, austerity. These are specific elements of, global, of corporate globalization which again favor investors and corporations at the expense of workers. And that means it's much harder for workers to have bargaining power. It makes it much harder to organize unions. It makes it much harder to organize, uh, to pass laws and regulations. Because if you pressure your government and say, we want you to raise the minimum wage, the, the, uh, the policymakers will say, hey, that looks bad for the business climate. Uh, our investors will leave. They'll take their jobs and move. And in fact, one of my favorite stories is a uh, small tangent, but in the New York City living wage campaign, we're pushing for uh, employers who get subsidies. If, if an employer comes to New York City and gets a million dollars to build the Walmart or to build something that they would have to pay a living wage, the New York Chamber of Commerce said, or not, actually, the, well, first the New York Chamber of Commerce said, hey, you're going to hear lots about research and data, but that none of that matters. What matters is the truth. And that what the truth is, is that this will cost jobs. <laughs> um, and then the New York, uh, New York Nightlife Association said, listen, if you pass a living wage job, uh, if you pass a living wage law, we will be forced to take our jobs and move. And this is the New York Nightlife Association. So you have to wonder where are those jobs going to go? Are they going to go to Kansas? It doesn't seem likely. <laughs> Um, but this is the threat effect, right? And policymakers say, oh, whoops, we better not pass these uh, laws that favor workers. So this is a particular form of globalization that allows corporations to have this threat effect. And one of the major planks of neoliberalism, of corporate globalization, is what we hear uh, the term flexibility. And that means, in specific, flexibility in labor markets. Now, this might sound good. And actually, I think a lot of us might think, yeah, it'd be great if my life was more flexible. I have childcare needs. I have elderly parents that need taken care of. I'd like to do some other hobbies and activities. Flexibility sounds great. Um, but in fact, flexibility doesn't necessarily mean that. And I'm going to share with uh, you a few quotes. Um, this is a quote, the rates of return on investment in the same new technologies are correspondingly less in Europe and Japan because businesses there face higher costs of displacing workers than we do. That's a bit wordy. Second one, uh, flexi uh, flexibility is most readily achieved by fostering an environment of maximum competition. A key element in creating this environment is flexible labor markets. These are quotes by Alan Greenspan, who many of you know. Um, and the point here really is that what we need to do is make things easier on investors, on employers, so that they can move rapidly in the global economy, so they are not impeded by having to 
hire more workers than they need that they can fire and hire at will. Uh, just one more quote. Uh, this is Stephen Ratner, who was one of the leading advisors to Obama on the auto restructuring. Eliminating jobs with all the wrenching human costs raises productivity and thereby competitiveness. So flexibility was a major plank in the 90s in particular and 2000s of policymakers who saw this as a way to restoring productivity and competitiveness in the global economy. And to do that, flexibility at its heart meant taking away the rights of workers, their protections to jobs. It meant shifting the costs and risks of employment as much as possible from the employer to the worker. So no longer does the employer have any responsibility to pay workers for a minute that, of work that they don't need. No longer do they have to pay them for benefits. No longer do they have to pay, the, pay insurance or cover health um, re regulations. They convert them to independent contractors and temp workers. Uh, they outsource and offshore, and they reduce their responsibilities towards the workers. Workers now carry that responsibility on themselves. Now, if there's a if there's a storm in Manhattan, if it's raining, the worker covers the cost of slow sales. It's not the employer. The employer is getting hourly sales goals from their corporate headquarters, and they're watching those goals. And if they're not meeting those goals, then they're sending workers home or calling them in. In the past, they'd have to have workers there to cover the shift, and they would have to eat the cost of the bad weather or the slow customer flow. But now it's the worker who eats that cost. So this is flexibility. OK, so flexibility sounds good, but in practice, it is not good. It mostly means attacks on unions, because unions are one of the main impediments, according to employers, in terms of their abilities to hire and fire at will, to implement new technologies, to implement new uh, practices at work. It also means shifting to part-time and what we call just-in-time scheduling. So this is what we used to ha hear about just-in-time manufacturing when employers didn't want to have to absorb any of the extra costs of extra inventory. Now they don't want to have to absorb any extra labor costs. So they only want the amount of workers they need right there at that time. Now how do they do that? Many of these employers are now, if they have a big store, if they need 200 workers, they'll hire 500 workers. And they'll make those workers, in a sense, compete for hours. That workers have to meet certain sales quotas. They have to be on time. They have to be, uh, actually, they don't have to be on time. They have to be more than on time. They have to show up early. They have to clock out late. Um, and they have to sign up people for credit cards. They have to sign up people on email lists. And this is if they do these things, then they can get more hours of work. They compete against one another for hours of work. So 100 years ago, we were fighting against overwork, against the 12-hour day and the 10-hour day. That still happens, but now we're also fighting for the right to work. Um, so flexibility in practice also means the shift to independent contractors, uh, as I mentioned. And we see the growth of things like uh, Uber, which says, we're not an employer, we're an app. We don't hire people, we just are an app. Um, it makes it easier to fire, easier to hire immigrant workers with fewer rights. Um, and it, the whole uh, strategy is keeping wages low, sometimes through direct uh, corporate practice, but often with the assistance, assistance of governments who agree to policies to keep wages low, sometimes being pressured by international institutions, uh, such as the IMF and World Bank, um, or by pressured by trade agreements and investment agreements with countries like the United States. OK. so. Globalization is part of this um, explanation, but I would say again, just to emphasize, it's neoliberalism and flexibility. What it does is it reduces workers' bargaining power. And I don't know if any of you uh, saw earlier this year the International Monetary Fund, of all places, released a report that said, hey, we've been saying for 20 to 30 years that inequality is being driven by skills and technology and globalization, and it turns out we were wrong. That's an incomplete story. In fact, this is a story of workers' bargaining power. <laughs> and uh, they said one of the main reasons workers have lost bargaining power has been the dramatic attack on unions worldwide. Without unions, workers have not had the ability to bargain for their fair share of productivity growth and their fair share of higher wages. OK, so we have even now the International Monetary Fund is agreeing that we have a problem of worker bargaining power, we have a problem of inequality, and we have a problem of low wages. <laughs>
So what can we do about it? Um, okay, so the response has been actually, I would say, going on for quite a while, at least since the 70s, when neoliberalism was initially introduced in the form of structural adjustment policies in the global south, workers were protesting from the very beginning. Um, those of us in the richer countries didn't always pay attention to those protests, but they've been going on um, for a long time. Um, and then we saw a little bit, we got our attention in 1994 in Chiapas, Mexico, when the Zapatistas rose up uh, and declared war on the Mexican state uh, the day that NAFTA went into effect. Um, and this began to kind of, you know, trigger more awareness that this issue of neoliberalism, of corporate globalization, was a serious problem and required a serious fight back. Um, that inspired um, decades of uh, glo uh, anti-globalization movement and um, I would say the living wage movement in the United States that also started in 1994. So in the 90s we saw increasing resistance to what was neoliberalism overseas but took the form of neoliberalism and what we call structural adjustment at home as well. The same kinds of trends going on, employers demanding flexibility, policymakers rewriting the rules, deregulating labor markets, keeping wages down. Um, okay, and then that movement slows a bit after the economic crisis in 2008, but then picks up again a lot in the last few years, particularly we see the anti-austerity pro uh, protests across Europe. Um, and then we see 2011. Um, and I should say that I've been working on the living wage uh, movement, on living wage issues since the early, since the mid 90s in the United States. I had thought at in 2010, in the early part of 2011, I thought that this movement is dead. We had the economic crisis. It seemed we couldn't do anything. There was not a voice in Congress on any side of the aisle that seemed interested in raising wages. In New York City, we could not even get a Democratic-controlled city council to consider a living wage ordinance of $10 an hour in Manhattan. 2011 happens. We have the Arab Spring. We have Wisconsin uh, protests against Scott Walker, attacks on collective bargaining. We have Occupy Wall Street. Um, and then this begins to generate an opening for those people who have been fighting against inequality and talking about low wages for many decades. But suddenly it seems like the world is starting to pay attention that something is just not right, something isn't working. Um, and in fact, after Occupy, one month after the New York living wage campaign was going on for several years, two months into the Occupy movement, the New York City Council passed the living wage ordinance. Okay, Occupy, uh, you know, that's a whole nother talk and I, I've done a lot of research and I was uh, actually spent a lot of time in Zuccotti Park so we could talk about that later. But one thing I would say is the legacy is it inspired many activists who worked with, veteran activists who were advisors to and worked with the Occupy movement who said, you know, what we've been doing hasn't been working. We've been spending millions of dollars on focus groups, on polling, on trying to get our message just right, on trying to get the ask just right. These, uh, you know, young people just went out and made a bold statement and said, we're, you know, we're just doing this, and they captured the world's attention. And that really inspired a lot of activists to say, hey, you know, let's try that. Let's, let's launch something. We don't know where it's going. We don't know what's going to happen, but let's make a bold demand. So one year after the eviction of Zuccotti Park, uh, we see workers, fast food workers in New York City go on strike. This is working with the union SEIU and community organizations um, such as one called the Make, Make the Road and New York Communities for Change. What they had found is that a lot of uh, the people they talked to worked in fast food, Fast food is a dangerous job. It's low wage. It has many of the bad qualities and, not, and very few of the good qualities. You don't even really get to have friendly customer service in this field. Um, and so workers said, hey, OK, we've had it. Enough is enough. We have to start fighting back. Um, they decided to launch a strike. And they made the demand for $15 an hour and the right to form a union. And I can talk later about the $15 an hour. but. If you remember, I was talking earlier about living wages being around the realm of $10 an hour, $11 an hour. We could barely win that. So this strike comes out, workers saying, we want $15 an hour, a huge increase from what we had been advocating 
and in Manhattan at the time, the, the minimum wage was 7.25 an hour, so uh, more than doubling the wage. And I will admit, I was one of the people that was totally skeptical. I thought there's no way that this is going to happen. There's there's no chance that this wage can win. Um, but we see the fast food strikes start to spread, and they're not necessarily always a lot of workers involved. Sometimes they're not even a a true strike in the sense that they shut down the workplace. That might be just a walkout of some workers, but they were coalitions of people that were supporting um, from the community, from unions, from the clergy who would go and support workers. Um, so the strikes spread across the country, um, 2012, 2013, 2014. By earlier in this year, 2015, over strikes in over 230 cities across the United States and solidarity actions in over 30 countries around the world. And it spreads. It's not just fast food workers. Uh, I think I actually put it back here. Walmart workers, warehouse workers, airport workers, domestic workers begin to engage in the strikes as well. We see warehouse workers at Walmart go on strikes uh, as well. Walmart workers demand more hours of work and a $25,000 uh, annual salary. Last year, Walmart workers in Los Angeles uh, engage in a sit-down strike. So this is a big dramatic change and an upsurge in activity um, in what we're seeing, what we had been seeing just a few years before that. Okay, so, uh, and then, and in the last couple of years, uh, this Fight for 15 movement begins to merge with what we have as a Black Lives Matter movement, uh, civil rights, anti-police brutality movement in the United States. So it's taking the form of a broader social movement that's shaped around the right to higher wages and unions, but also is about much more uh, civil rights as well. Um, okay, so. What's very interesting is that we begin to see some major victories. And right now I'm just going to list what we're seeing somewhat in the United States. We've seen, um, now the living wage movement's been going on in the US since 1994. Many cities won living wage ordinances, but they mostly didn't cover a lot of workers. They were primarily directed at cities, at municipalities, and they covered workers that had service contracts or that got economic development subsidies. Three cities had citywide minimum wages. Um, but in the last three years, over 30 cities have passed uh, citywide minimum wages. And the wages are now up to $16 an hour. So this is incredible. I cannot keep up with how much is happening. States are raising their state minimum wages. Cities and states are tying their wages to inflation. Um, and some of them are including other kinds of benefits in there. The, for example, some of the ordinances say that if an employer wants to hire f any additional workers, they first have to give part-time workers the opportunity to work full-time before they can hire part-time workers. So this is a really big change in what's happening. We're also seeing corporations begin to announce themselves that they're going to raise their bottom line minimum wage. Uh, it's now the Walmart, the Gap, um, Target, uh, uh, lots of employers like this. And they're starting to say they're going to eliminate the practice of on-call scheduling. Um, and we're also seeing kind of dramatic new uh, policies in San Francisco. San Francisco passed something called the Retail Workers' Bill of Rights. Workers now have the right to get their schedules uh, two weeks in advance. If their schedules are changed within 24 hours, they get extra pay. They get, they're given pay uh, for a minimum number of hours of shifts. And, uh, for and, and like I said, they're given the right to get full-time work before the company can begin hiring part-time workers. Um, OK, so but it's not just the United States. Um, this movement for higher wages has been going on around the world uh, in the last several decades as well, and increasingly in the last several years. You obviously know that yourselves very well here in Canada. Uh, you have some very strong advocates here for uh, living wage who have worked on this issue for quite a while. Um, so we see wage campaigns going on in many parts of the world. The International Labor Organization has said that uh, living wages, minimum wages, is one of the key fundamental issues of our times. Um, some of this is, seems like a victory. You could also say it's a defeat. Um, Germany just passed its first minimum wage law ever last year. Um, and you might say that's good, but in fact it reflects that 
unions have become so weak that they haven't been able to keep wages up at the bottom end of the labor market. And so where we could once set higher wages through collective bargaining, um, we now have to set it through legislation. So I don't mean to say this is all a victory, but it suggests that uh, workers around the world are concerned about the issue of low wage work. We're also seeing workers you know, fight around this issue of precarious work. And interestingly, we're seeing some states begin to re-regulate some aspects of temporary work, giving workers more rights uh, in the last few years and giving some protections to temporary workers, uh, uh, independent contractors, and so forth. Um, again, around scheduling, workers are getting some rights. Some uh, countries and uh, cities are saying that work employers can no longer discriminate against part-time workers. They have to offer the same benefits and the same pay to part-time workers that they offer full-time workers. We're seeing fighting against the practice of franchising, and that's one of the things that's allowed corporations to do this, is they say, hey, we're not responsible for what our franchisees do. If we're McDonald's, we, you know, are, we're, we don't operate every store. We, that's up to the franchisee. That's their wages. But in fact, what we know is that the corporate headquarters sets very strong budgetary guidelines and, and goals, sales goals each month, and payroll goals. And so managers of franchises tell us that they feel they have no choice whatsoever because they have to, if you can only pay a certain amount of your payroll in wages, you can't raise wages, right? And if you have to meet a certain sales quota that's set by the corporation, and that's sometimes set down to the hourly, <laughs> hourly level, you can't, set, um, you can't do that. So we're seeing fight back against franchising, holding the corporation accountable, holding them responsible for what they do in franchises, um, and, and going where the money's at. Because we know the money's not always at the franchise level, it's at the corporate level. Okay, and I should say not just the franchises, but throughout the supply chain. So we're seeing situations such as in London where the Competitions Commission has made a ruling that supermarkets like Tesco are using monopoly powers to extract unfair pricing contracts from their suppliers. And they've assigned a public ombudsperson to say, you have to give fair prices to your suppliers, to the farmers in Africa uh, who grow the products for your supermarket, you have to pay them fair prices. Um, okay, so that is some of the victories of what we're seeing in the United States, but also around the world. Um, and I think what I want to do now is just move to talking about what to think about all this. <laughs> How do we evaluate this movement? Um, and I would say that um, I don't really have slides for this part because uh, what I want to say is that on the one hand, this is a tremendously exciting time. Workers are winning real gains. Their wages are going up dramatically in some places, less dramatically in other places, but they're real victories in the sense of raising wages and changing scheduling practices. There's a real challenge to the neoliberal um, ideology that says that we're going to restore competitiveness on the backs of workers. Um, and we're even hearing states reassert their rights to regulate labor markets and say, OK, for 30 years we said states should stay out of the economy altogether. Now we're going to step back in and start to set um, minimum wages, raise wages, um, uh, set scheduling uh, regulations, and so forth. So it's an exciting time. But on the other hand, there are a lot of concerns to this movement. And, um, and one thing to know is that, for the most part, the idea of raising wages, uh, setting a higher minimum wage and a living wage, is tremendously popular. It always pulls very strongly. In the United States, 70, 80 percent of voters vo favor this. Even Republican voters, evangelical Christian voters, pretty much everyone except for um, people who have been trained in economics um, <laughs> and uh, the very wealthy, the, the one percent. Um, so even when, when it's on the ballot in what we call red states, conservative states, those voters vote to raise the minimum wage. Um, and in fact, some polling says voters there's more support for a $15 an hour wage than there is for $12 an hour. So voters are like, hey, if you're going to raise a wage, make it real. We all, we'll, more people support the higher wage. Um, so that's a good thing. But what it suggests is we have a pretty broad coalition with very diverse politics within that coalition. And what I say is sometimes the least common denominator politics, that we can agree that workers deserve a fair wage for the work that they do. But many people make a distinction between deserving and non-deserving. 
and it's very much framed as people who work hard should be able to feed themselves, right? Well, what about the people who don't have jobs? What about the people who, uh, you know, who have lost their job or don't have enough hours of work? Um, the very troubling fact is throughout the last several decades, many of the same city councils and mayors that have passed living wage ordinances have also been passing laws that further criminalize poverty, that make it uh, a crime to be homeless, to ask for money in the streets, to sleep in public spaces. So we're criminalizing more and more the poor while passing these laws. So there's a division there about how we frame this and understand this about an issue of the deserving poor who participate in labor markets as good citizens and then everyone else. So this is a big problem and I think all of us who consider ourselves on the left or progressive have to be aware of that. The living wage is also, it's not a solution to poverty. Even if you get $15 an hour in Manhattan, that's not a living wage for most people. And of course, in many of these industries, people don't have full-time work. So it's not a solution, it's a tool. Um, but you still, you can have a higher wage, but unless you have a union, you have no job security, you have no grievance procedure, you might not have any health benefits, and many of the laws are violated regularly. We have issues of wage theft um, that occur all the time. We have things like retail workers who, when they are done with their shift, they're forced to clock out, and then they have to go stand in a long line to be checked by security guards who check their bags and make sure they didn't steal any of the clothing. That's done on their own time. They're not paid for that. That's a violation of the law. But wage theft takes many different forms. Um, and if you're in line for 20 minutes af unpaid after a two-hour shift, um, this money adds up. OK, so the minimum wage uh, is not a solution. Living wage is not a solution. But I would say that, um, you know, well, and then one other thing, as I would say, is it also suggests that it's much easier to pass a higher minimum wage than it is to win some of our other demands. And in particular, as I said, this fast food started out as the $15 an hour and the right to form a union. In almost no case has it yet resulted in workers unionizing. So many employers would much rather pay a higher wage if it means keeping the union out. Um, and political parties, of course, would maybe much rather concede a uh, higher minimum wage because, in a sense, it's not a cost to them. And in fact, it could be a benefit. It could be a stimulus to the economy. Um, that's much better than giving unions more rights. Um, and I should say that in the US, neither political party has ever been much of a supporter of this movement. Even though Democrat and Republican voters overwhelmingly support higher wages, for the most part, Democrat and Republican politicians overwhelmingly oppose them. <laughs> so this also is a highlight of how democracy does not work. Um, OK. <laughs> so, uh, so then what do we think of this? There's all these you know, concerns with the minimum wage movement. Um, but what I argue and why I continue to work with this movement is that I think that despite the challenges, despite the ways it can be framed to divide uh, working people, um, I would say that the minimum wage campaigns are a tool for organizing more than they are a solution. And what they are is a way to bring together people of all kinds of backgrounds, again, Republicans and Democrats, um, some, many small business owners who support higher wages, workers, students, environmentalists. It's a way to build coalitions of people that don't normally work together. And most importantly, it's a way to have conversations about the economy, to talk about who sets wages, who gets to determine what someone's worth, who sets human value, the, the value of human life. Um, why do we have wages at all? And if we go back several hundred years to the original use of the term living wage, many people see the living wage as an actual concession, that initially many workers fought against the actual notion of wage labor and called it wage slavery and said we should not have to sell our labor for a wage. We should control our own work. Living wage was to say, OK, if we have to sell our wages, uh, our labor for a wage, then it should at least be a living wage. So in my view, the living wage movement is also a space to have those conversations to talk about what kind of economy we want and who should be in charge. I think we don't want to get stuck on the technicalities of this movement of the methodologies of determining a living wage are very important, but we can get trapped by employers or policymakers who make us get stuck fighting for that. And I think in Canada, you've been much more successful in setting some formulas and, and going forward with it. But in many other parts of the world, they'll get st stuck in technical debates um, on and on. And I think we have to say, we have some 
we have good research, we have good evidence to back up these numbers, but we're really also backing up a principle here. The principle that uh, workers are not, workers' worth is not determined by what the employer says that they're worth, but they're determined by human need. Um, and I think even on the scheduling, like, uh, you know, the challenge is we kind of fight from a regular scheduling, but in fact, flexibility sounded good because it sounds good. <laughs> we don't want to go back to 40 hour work week. I don't think that's what we want to be fighting for, right? We want to fight for uh, a shorter work week. We want to fight to spread the work. We want to fight to control our labor, to share the labor, to say we, we want some time off work. We want to do other things with our lives that have meaning. And there's more than enough money in the world that we can do that. So this is a space to say, let's think about that. Now, what's interesting, this moment in history is um, fascinating. On the one hand, neoliberalism is on the attack more fiercely than ever. If we look at Greece, if we look at austerity attacks, if we uh, look at uh, what's happening to public sector collective bargaining, all kinds of assaults on working people, all kinds of assaults on the planet and on uh, citizens. On the other hand, we're winning a lot. We're winning lots of things. And so the question is, how are we winning and why are we winning at this moment? Is it because there are a lot of elites who now realize that neoliberalism isn't working? Um, in 2009, Martin Wolf, who's the chief economics correspondent for the Financial Times, said, we tested it, we tested neoliberalism, we tested financial capitalism, and it failed. It was a failure, it doesn't work but we don't know what comes after it. Um, and as I said, the International Monetary Fund, many economists who once were on the forefront of advocating neoliberal policies have said it didn't work. So we're at this moment where we're saying, uh, okay, let's talk about something else. So I think our job is not to take us back to the more narrow uh, vision of what we had, but to be expansive and to go beyond that. There will be forces who want a more moderate solution, who say, okay, there's benefits to raising the wages. Uh, if we raise minimum wages a, a bit, it will increase consumer demand. It can regenerate the economy. It can get things back and running to how they were a couple de decades ago. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I just don't think that should be the limits of the vision of what we're fighting for. I think this is the time when we say, uh, let's challenge the whole notion of wage labor. Let's challenge the whole notion of capitalism as a system that is governing our planet. Let's challenge the notion that profit uh, that profit is what drives our economy. And let's begin to center this around human need um, and human potential. And so that's what I think is the best part of this living wage movement. And I say, like, let's focus it on the wages, but let's really focus it on the living and talk about the world that we want to live in. So thank you very much. <laughs>